Uh, I'm going to introduce our guest, Paul Blair, today. As you know, uh, uh, Paul's spoken here, I imagine, many times before. and uh, twice. Uh, twice. Well, that's yeah. <laughs> so he's a member too. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Paul, I won't go any further. I'll just turn it over to you. Thank you. Mike, thank you very much. I probably don't need the microphone, do I? Do I need it? I have to have it for you. I, I need it for you. Okay, very good. Well, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. And uh, forgive me, I'm uh, but I was out of town this weekend. I was actually uh, I'm part of an organization called Council for National Policy, and I was in Washington uh, for meetings. We're reviewing or interviewing all the presidential candidates. In fact, we had Ben Carson there this weekend. Uh, ben is probably one of the finest men that uh, has ever run for office, uh, but I would not say that he's prepared to serve in that capacity. He's a great man. I mean, boy, he's really a good man. But uh, I probably, if I had to make a decision today, would not cast a ballot for him. Uh, it was interesting that uh, we uh, had, uh, oh, who else? Uh, Rand Paul. And Rand Paul was really, uh, you know, the typical response from many Christians is they think that Rand Paul is just out there. Uh, but it's amazing that after he got done speaking, so many of these people were going, hey, I could vote for him. You know what? He's a constitutionalist. I'm not saying that I would cast a ballot for Rand if I was voting today, but we need somebody that understands what the Constitution is, respects it, and is bound by it. And he may be, uh, as far as those running, as, as qualified as any by that criteria. What was really interesting is this, this group was actually started in, in 1981, right after the Reagan Revolution. And it was started by uh, ministers, men like uh, uh, LaHaye and, and uh, 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 Falwell and others. And it's a, it's a national public policy institute that's a uh, very strong conservative and very strong Christian influence. Uh, Tony Perkins from Family Research Council is, uh, is the elected president. Uh, Bob McEwen, a uh, former congressman from Ohio, committed Christian. We've actually had Bob at our Reclaiming America Christ conferences. Bob is the uh, paid executive director, so it's a very, uh, Dick and Rich Bott are active members of this. Stu Epperson from Salem Communications, so it's a strong influence Christian organization. But with that being said, it was amazing. Of all the guys, in fact, Rick, Rick Santorum spoke this week, which was a very, he was very good. But it was amazing, out of all the presidential candidates that, that spoke this week, the biggest crowd was uh, Donald Trump. So even in a Christian group, it's amazing the energy that he is uh, generating, because people like the straight talk. Now, here's the problem with Donald Trump. Uh, there's no depth. There's just not any depth there. You keep waiting for some depth, and there's just not any depth there. So be sensitive to that as you go forward. Listen to these guys. Try to listen for answers, not just talking points. But uh, we certainly need to have the Christian community have a chance to meet with uh, Huckabee here the first week in November. Um, and, of course, all these guys, well, I, I, would, I would have to agree. If I had to vote today, and I don't, fortunately, but if I had to make a decision today, it'd probably be for Ted Cruz. I think overall, if you had to take everything into consideration, including uh, fundraising abilities and respect for the Constitution and Christian faith, it'd probably be him today. But again, I, fortunately, we're not voting today, but uh, you know, if anybody cares, I will be glad to try to share what insight we can, and I'll uh, communicate through Mike. You know, it's interesting, I was talking to Bobby Cleveland just a few minutes ago, and, and with, with Steve and, and Mike, and well, I'll tell you what, if we had more churches like Olivet and Steve Kern, we wouldn't have the problems that we have in the country. I really appreciate Steve's courage and his faithfulness to proclaim the truth without compromise. He is really uh, a great man and a great friend. But it's amazing we have had truth redefined in America. So consequently, we are operating off of false assumptions. You know, Bobby's talking about uh, the difficulty he is finding in getting the OSSAA to allow prayer in their uh, uh, playoff games. And the standard response, even by many school superintendents, is the separation of church and state. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no such thing as the separation of church and state. But if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and it's not refuted, people eventually accept it as fact. And I'll start with that because that's really where we're at here. Woodrow Wilson, long before he was president, when he was president of Princeton University actually at the time, in 1887, he wrote an article that was published in Political Science Quarterly, basically outlining the agenda uh, or his strategy for revamping the, the direction of the country and, and, and promoting his progressive uh, worldview. And I'll just summarize, but basically it consists of three steps. He said, well, one generation would resist, but eventually accept. The next generation would accept it because their parents did. And the next generation would just assume that it's always been that way. Well, that's where we're at right now. 
we don't even pause to look at what the Constitution actually says anymore. We operate based upon what we think that it says. And consequently, we're going in completely a wrong direction. I'm going to give you a, a little bit, something that's new, but uh, a little bit of fresh information to remind you of what the truth is. Of course, you guys are certainly well aware of much of this, but we're going to lead into the event that we have this weekend and uh, hope that you'll help us promote and participate that. Understand that our founding fathers came to the uh, new world for uh, religious and uh, civil liberty. And they were predominantly Christian men. I mean, uh, Patricia Bonomi, who was a, a university professor out of New York University, and her research, she said that in 1776, of the inhabitants of the United States, 98% of them were Protestant. The other 2% were either Catholic or Jewish. So we were 100% a Judeo-Christian uh, country. But these colonists that came here to the New World, of course, we know we're well aware of the Pilgrims and the Puritans up in here, the Anglicans that settled down in the Southern, but they were free men. They were able to, by their charters, elect their own legislatures. They could make their own laws. They could tax themselves as they deemed necessary, and in fact paid no taxes overseas. They could own property. They could buy and sell and trade with whomever they chose, and most importantly, they were free to study the Bible and worship the Lord in spirit and truth without fear of the uh, oppression of the uh, Anglican Church, the Church of England. But over time, the government of England, led by the kings of England, by the way, there were some good and some bad. Uh, they kept getting worse progressively, but they illegally broke the charters. Now, the charters were agreements. They were basically the constitutions of these colonies. They were agreements between the mother country and the new world, and this bound both sides. Well, the king just said, you know what? I don't like the charter. I'm just going to ignore it and void it. I've got a phone and I've got a pen. I'll do whatever I want to do. And, and, and it was against the law, but that's what he did anyway. He dissolved the legislatures. Didn't like the decisions they were making, so hang you guys. I'm just going to dissolve you. Uh, trade was suppressed. Uh, taxes were levied without representation. Standing armies were housed in the colonies in order to uh, uh, make sure that his unpopular acts stuck. And there was no more trial of jury by peers. In fact, you had to even go to England for many trials. And the most important thing, again, the thing that really uh, ignited the, the cause to come to the New World to begin with was religious liberty. And this is one thing that we're not taught anymore. But he had a plan to reestablish the Church of England over the colonies and control the pulpits. Well, when all this came to light, it was that, that primarily was the last straw, that led the colonists to restore the proper role of government and restore liberty in these united colonies. As a matter of fact, you've heard this before, you've heard Dan Fisher, if it wasn't for the pulpits, we wouldn't have the country that we have right now. The pulpits were bold, the pulpits were aflame with fire, and these guys had understanding of biblical principles of civil government. They knew the direction that we were heading. As a matter of fact, they were called the Black Robe Regiment, and they recognized tyranny when it was on the horizon. And these guys ascended into their pulpits and in black clerical robes on Sunday mornings and inflamed the people's hearts toward liberty. Now notice one pastor's sermon. This is Jonathan Mayhew. He pastored West Church in Boston. I just want to make some points on this as I lead into what we're doing here in the state of Oklahoma. His sermon, entitled A Discourse, concerning unlimited submission and non-resistance to the higher powers. They were even dealing with the Romans 13 issue back then. Okay, if God established government, uh, then are we just supposed to, as Christians, submit to whatever the government says? And the response was, no, we don't have unlimited submission to government. And, and again, you've, you've probably heard me share with these things before. Let me just, let me just chase a rabbit here or, or give an explanation. You know, according to the Bible, there's not just civil government. I mean, there's self-government, there's family government, there's church government, and there's civil government, all established and ordained by God. Let's take a look at family government for an example. According to the Word of God, Am I supposed to have oversight of my children? <clears throat> are my children are supposed to obey me? Is that right? Children, obey your parents. Okay. So if I told Joshua, Joshua, I want you to take the trash out, son. What should Joshua do? Take the trash out. Now if I said, Jacob, would you, would you mow the yard, son? Okay, then Jacob should mow the yard. What happens if a father decided that he wanted to sexually molest one of his children? Well, wait a second, the Bible says children obey your parents. No, 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 it's not unlimited submission. It's children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. I'm the pastor of Fairview Baptist Church. According to the scripture, I'm supposed to be the spiritual leader of that flock that, uh, that, uh, that I'm feeding and leading. 
But, and they're supposed to submit to my leadership. But what would happen if all of a sudden, if I went to the church office tomorrow and I told Sue, I said, uh, Sue, would you write me a check for $50,000? I'm going to go down to the Indian casinos. <laughs> and she said, well, pastor, should I do it? Hey, I'm the pastor. You're supposed to submit to my authority. No, she's not supposed to submit to my authority in that case. She's supposed to submit to my authority in the Lord for this is right. Now, the purpose of civil government, according to the Scripture, is to punish the evil and to protect the good that we may live peaceably in all godliness. Government is supposed to be for the good of mankind, not to oppress and tyrannize mankind. So when government becomes perverse, are we supposed to just provide unlimited submission? <clears throat> no. Did the Hebrew midwives murder the Hebrew children as they were commanded to do in Exodus 1? No. They defied the civil authority. Did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego bow down to the golden image in the plains of Shinar in Daniel 3? No. That was an ungodly, unlawful declaration by the king, so they rightfully disobeyed that unjust law. Okay. Now, here you've got a Mayhew. He said this, the king in his coronation oath swears to exercise only such a power as the Constitution gives him. The king does not have unlimited power. In fact, if you look back in the Bible, before the king ever assumed the throne in Israel, he was supposed to take a copy of the Torah, which was kept before the, the, in, the, in the temple, and he was supposed to write it out longhand, so he was familiar with every part of it, and then it said specifically that he was not free to turn to his left or to his right. He was bound by the Torah, which was the constitution of the nation of Israel. Likewise, the king only has authority in the areas where the constitution has granted him authority, is what Mayhew is saying here. And the citizen, in the oath of allegiance, swears only to obey in the exercise of such a power. The king is as much bound by his oath not to infringe the legal rights of the people as the people are bound to yield subjection to him from whence it follows that as soon as the king sets himself up above the law, he loses the king and the tyrant, and he does to all intents and purposes unking himself by acting out of and beyond that sphere which the Constitution allows him to move in. And in such cases, he has no more right to be obeyed than any inferior officer who acts beyond his commission. Ladies and gentlemen, our founding fathers did not consider themselves revolutionaries. They considered the King of England and Parliament as rebelling against the law. They believed that resistance to their tyranny was obedience to God. And Sam Adams declared on July the 2nd, which was the date that they actually voted to secede from, from British tyranny, he said, we have this day restored the sovereign to whom all men ought to be obedient. He reigns in heaven from the rising to the setting of the sun. Let his kingdom come. Amen. They believed that the king had rebelled and they were restoring the right rule of law. Okay, is everybody still with me? Let's look at the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence was our declaration of secession from the tyranny of the English government. It was not our operator's manual. It was our birth certificate. And within it, you see our mission statement. To assume among the powers of the earth a separate equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. Within it, you see our statement of faith. We are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. And within it, you see the purpose of government. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And after stating 27 grievances that they had with Great Britain, justifying their secession, they committed themselves to the cause. For we support this declaration with a firm alliance and the protection of God Almighty, of divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred yeah. honor. Well, of course, the king didn't just accede to that. We had to fight for our liberty and eventually did. And of course, in the Treaty of Paris that was signed at the end of the war, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, notice the reverence for God Almighty in the name of the most holy and undivided trinity. These men were not deists. They were not atheists. They called as witness this entire peace treaty, they called God, the triune God, to bear witness to this whole event. But notice in Article 1, His Britannic Majesty acknowledges the said United States, New Hampshire, Massachusetts Bay, Rhode Island, plantations, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Maryland, and North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, to be free, sovereign, and independent states. And then he references them as them. Here's the point, ladies and gentlemen. It wasn't a war between one nation versus another nation. 
It was Great Britain versus 13 nations working together in a unity of sovereign states. Is everybody with me still? Now, I said a moment ago that the Declaration of Independence was their birth certificate. It was. It had nothing in it as far as the practice of government, how we were to function. Our very first constitution was actually called the Articles of Confederation. And this is what we used throughout the war with our Continental Congress and then after the war from 1783 to 1787. And notice this, it says the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union. Understand what the term Perpetual Union means. That means that there's no sunset clause in it. You know, whenever I do a wedding, it's a perpetual union. According to the Bible, it's supposed to be unto death do us part. Unfortunately, there's been a rare occasion. Thankfully, it's a rare occasion, but there have been occasions where it doesn't make it that far. The two parties wind up coming into disagreement and they wind up separating. But what a perpetual union means is there's not a sunset clause. It wasn't a statement where they said, okay, we're going to use this for three years, and then on December the 31st, 1785, this is going to be null and void. It was a perpetual union. We're entering into this operating agreement between the 13 sovereign states. By the way, we'll call this confederacy the United States of America. And Article 2, that's Article 1, Article 2, each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, independence, in every power, jurisdiction, and right which is not by this confederation expressly delegated to the United States in Congress assembled. Does that clause sound familiar? Uh, yes. Exactly. We carried that over into the U.S. Constitution. And again, their primary league of friendship was for common defense. The general welfare. If we are attacked from without, then we are going to band together to defend our liberty. But when it comes to what goes on inside the state of Georgia, that's Georgia's business. What goes on inside North Carolina, it's North Carolina's business. What goes on inside Virginia is Virginia's business. Are you still with me? Okay, very good. Now, in 1787, there were some things that they believed were flawed in that. One was the ability to tax. That's debatable. Uh, and... 12 of the 13 states gathered in Philadelphia in 1787 to amend or strengthen the Articles of Confederation. They wound up coming up with, we'll not chase this rabbit, but they wound up coming up with a new U.S. Constitution. And what was the purpose? We, the people of the United States, in order to form a union, no, we already were operating as a union, in order to form a more perfect union, now understand, the Declaration of Independence was our birth certificate. It was not the operator's manual. This is the operator's manual. And what the 13 states did was they designed the general government. Three branches, legislative, which was, was comprised of a pure democracy. Each state had a representative uh, to, uh, that related to the, the uh, percentage of the state's population. And then you had the Senate, which guaranteed the states' rights. These two together, now let me, let me correct you on something here, because we've all been taught wrong. These are not three co-equal branches. The legislature was always to be the most powerful branch, because that represented the people. And it is we, the people. Do you realize, now this is in accordance with Brian McClanahan, we had Brian at one of our uh, conferences a couple years ago, but during the first five presidential administrations, Washington served two terms, uh, Adams served one term, Jefferson served two terms, um, uh, Madison served two terms, and Monroe served two terms, during the first five presidential administrations, the presidents only issued ten vetoes because the president did not believe that it was his responsibility to rule over the country. He only issued a veto if he was convinced that the action taken by the People's Assembly was an unconstitutional action, and in that case, he issued a veto. Also understand that the judiciary was the weakest. As a matter of fact, in the Constitution, the term supreme is not even capitalized. It's a small s. And up until the 1930s, they didn't even have their own building. They operated in the basement of the Capitol building because the Supreme Court had few and defined areas of jurisdiction. By the way, none of which is to make law. Whose responsibility is it to make law? Exclusively the legislature. 
But here's what happened. I find this ironic. I was in Boston <coughs> just a couple of weeks ago, and this is called Austin Hall. It's one of the buildings of the law school at Harvard University. I thought it interesting that engraved in stone around the top of this building is Exodus 18.20. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk and work and the work that they must do. In other words, around the law school, we are chartered to be bound by the law and rule according to the law. Yet it was out of Harvard that under the leadership of Christopher Columbus, Christopher Columbus Langdale, we got this idea of case law. That judges can create law from the bench. Let me give you a little quick reminder. Which branch can exclusively make law? <laughs> Legislative. There is no such thing as case law. The judiciary can offer opinions and they can even make decisions based upon prior precedent but there is no such thing as, well, Mr. President, the Supreme Court has ruled and, uh, and same-sex marriage is now the law of the land. The Supreme Court cannot make law. That's not within their power to do. Well, why are we functioning like this? Because we've been trained, remember Woodrow Wilson? We've been trained to think that it is within their power to do so. But anyway, back to the Constitution. We've got the design of the general government. We've got the role and the responsibilities of the general government. And then we've got the Bill of Rights. Some of the states said, hey, we don't trust this thing. We will not sign it unless we have absolute assurance that they cannot overstep their limited responsibility. So these were reminders of what the general government could not do. Now, ladies and gentlemen, 1787, with this background, recognize that our founding fathers did not create a system of government where 320 million people are ruled by five non-elected attorneys. We are a union of sovereign states that delegated few and defined powers to the general government to handle the general welfare. And Mr. Madison said in Federalist 45, no, oh, if only we would, you know, this stuff's not even hard. It's not even confusing. Everything has been discussed in the ratification conventions of the states. Everything was, was discussed at the Constitutional Convention. Everything was outlined. The Federalist Papers are 85 essays written to the state of New York by, by Madison and Jay and Hamilton defending this Constitution, hoping, hoping that the state of New York would, would ratify it. Now notice Federalist 45, the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. The former, being the federal government, will be exercised principally on external objects as war, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce, and foreign commerce, with which the last power of taxation will, for the most part, be connected. The powers reserved to the individual states will extend to all objects which, in the ordinary course of affairs, concern the lives, liberties, and properties of the people, and the internal order, improvement, and prosperity of the state. The operations of the federal government will be most extensive and important in times of war and danger. Those of the state governments in times of peace and security. Is there any question? Is that difficult for anyone? It's black and white. Yet, in 1963, the Warren Court decided that you could teach your children the Bible in public education. Where in the Constitution do they have that authority? Not there. Nowhere. In 1973, the Burger Court created, by the way, at this point in time, there were a few states that had legalized abortion. The overwhelming majority of the states did not have legalized abortion on demand. But by a 7-2 to two decision, the Burger Court created this new law, this right to privacy, and forced abortion on all 50 states and since then ladies and gentlemen we have had 58 million not choices babies murdered now think about this for just a second the next slide I've dimmed it down but it's graphic but I want to prepare you for it we dehumanize what we're talking about here in fact the pro-life movement does it too we talk about uh, oh uh, uh, aborting um, uh, the unborn well, that's very impersonal uh, we're going to terminate a pregnancy. Well, that's very rough. Oh, we want choice. Well, yeah, I agree. I think you should have choice. You've got choice to sleep with that guy or not to sleep with him. You've got choice to use some sort of contraceptive or choose not to use some sort of contra contraceptive. But understand, we're not talking about choice 
We are talking about babies. This is not tissue. We use the term fetus because nobody speaks Latin. But a fetus literally means a preborn baby. This is a baby. Not a choice. And we have the blood of 58 million of these on our hands because the Supreme Court ruled illegally, unlawfully, that this was now some constitutional right. And we the people, because we haven't <clears throat> kept up with our homework, we, we don't recognize what the Constitution actually limits the federal government, we have sat idly by and let this happen on our watch. And now, folks, this court has created the sanctioning of same-sex marriage and forced it on all 50 states. Now, let's go back to Mr. Madison. This you probably have not seen before, and that's why I'm glad to present it to you today. This is a report that he presented to the Virginia legislature in 1800. And here's what I want to point out. He says, the states then, being parties to the constitutional compact, and in their sovereign capacity, it follows of necessity that there can be no tribunal above their authority. There is no court over the states to decide as the last resort whether the Constitution, which was made by the states, be violated. Mr. Madison addressed this very issue. It's not up to the Supreme Court to tell the states whether the Constitution has been violated or not. It was the states, through the compact of the Constitution, that created the Supreme Court in the first place. The court is supposed to answer to the states and not the other way around. He goes on in this very same letter, in this very same presentation, he says, dangerous powers not delegated may not only be usurped and executed by other departments, it's not just the executive branch or the legislature that we've got to worry about. He says, the judicial department may also exercise or sanction dangerous powers beyond the grant of the Constitution. Has that happened? That's exactly what's happened. And Mr. Madison said that it cannot happen. can't be allowed to happen. Of course, you all are familiar with the uh, Virginia Resolution, Madison wrote in 1798, case of a deliberate, palpable, and dangerous exercise of other powers. Is forcing abortion on 50 states a deliberate, palpable, and dangerous exercise of other power? Yes. Yeah. Is forcing the 50 states to redefine marriage against their will? Now, by the way, if Massachusetts wants to legalize same-sex marriage, according to natural law, they can't because you can't violate God's law. But according to the way the Constitution is constructed, if Massachusetts wants to vote that they all go jump in the ocean, well, they can legally do that. But they can't impose that on the other 50 states. Is forcing the redefinition of marriage on all 50 states a deliberate, palpable, and dangerous exercise of other powers not granted by the Constitution? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Then the states or parties thereto have the right and are in fact duty-bound to stop it, to interpose for the arresting of the progress of evil and for maintaining within their respective limits. Again, Oklahoma has no say-so over Texas. We have no say-so over Kansas, but we do have say-so over the sovereign territory of the state of Oklahoma, the authorities' rights and liberties pertaining to them. Of course, you're familiar with Jefferson and the Kentucky Resolutions. He says that the several states composing the United States of America are not united on the principle of unlimited submission to the general government. Folks, we are not under the thumb of Washington. How difficult is this to understand? <clears throat> but that, by a compact under the style and title of a Constitution for the United States and of amendments thereto, the states constituted a general government for special purposes, delegated to that government certain definite specific powers, reserving each state to itself the residuary mass of right to their own self-government, and that whensoever the general government, the federal government, assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force. <clears throat> That's exactly what Reverend Mayhew was saying in 1749. Whenever the king acts outside the Constitution, then it's not a law, because he doesn't have the authority to do it. Does that make sense? <clears throat> okay. Oops, I'm going to have to do this over again. This must have shut down. This is John Eidsmo, constitutional scholar, attorney. We had him up here just a couple months ago. It's also Richard Mast with uh, Liberty Council. But uh, Eidsmo, I asked this question. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. 
He has seven earned degrees. He is a scholar on the Constitution. What would you say to the governor or the legislature of any of the over 30 states who have amended their state constitution to legally define, and lawfully, I should say, define marriage as one man and one woman? The Tenth Amendment reserves that power to the states. And in fact, you look to the Supremacy Clause itself, the Article 6, Section 2, which says that the Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land, what part of the Constitution? Well, the answer is all of it. That includes the amendments, because Article 5 says that an amendment is, for all intents and purposes, part of the Constitution. That means the Tenth Amendment is as much the supreme law of the land as any other part of the Constitution. Now, what in the Constitution delegates any power over marriage to the federal government? Nothing. What part of the Constitution prohibits the states from regulating marriage? Again, nothing. That being the case, the power over marriage is a power reserved to the states by the Tenth Amendment, and that is the supreme law of the land. I say to these government officials at the state level that if you aren't going to stand for that, you're not only violating your state constitution, you're violating the Tenth Amendment of the federal constitution as well. What would well, Justice Roberts, in his dissent, stated this? He says, the majority's decision, this is on the Obergefell decision just two months ago, the majority's decision is an act of the will, not legal judgment. The right it announces has no basis in the Constitution or this court's precedent. As a result, the court invalidates marriage laws of more than half the states and orders the transformation of a social institution that has formed the basis of human society for a millennia. Just who do we think we are? In a democratic republic, should that decision about same-sex marriage rest with the people acting through their elected representatives or with five lawyers who happen to hold commissions authorizing them to resolve legal disputes according to the law. The Constitution leaves no doubt about the answer. Ladies and gentlemen, what was done two months ago is an unlawful action. There is no constitutional basis for the decision. Justice Kennedy, amazingly, <clears throat> Two years ago in the U.S. versus Windsor case, the Defense of Marriage Act, Kennedy ruled in the majority decision that the, defense, the Federal Defense of Marriage Act was unconstitutional, stating that marriage was a state issue. Okay? Two months ago, he ruled that the state constitutions were unconstitutional, stating that the U.S. Constitution has supremacy. How can you play it both ways? Folks, we cannot, first of all, we were not designed to go and plead before the courts. The courts have very limited roles and responsibility. But it's quite obvious that we are no longer being ruled according to law. We are being ruled by the whim and will of men. Uh, I've shown you this before. I don't, well, I'll show it to you again. This, this organization I, I just got back from, this was a question that I asked, and again, I'll tell you what, there's, there's really excitement that's going on because people are hearing about this and it's giving them hope, not just in Oklahoma, but around the country. Because people say, of course, this makes perfect sense. Because we have been fighting a losing battle because it's a rigged game. Let me just ask you a question. How many of you know that I went to Oklahoma State University? Now imagine if I was the head of officiating for the OU OSU football game. <laughs> yes. What kind of chance do you think OU would have of winning the game? Not a snowball's chance in hell, I can assure you. I would make sure that every call went my, went my way. Now, with that in mind, consider this question that I asked some of our, our leaders. I mean, you've got, you got Tony Perkins in this from Family Research Council. You've got Todd Starnes from Fox News, conservative Christian columnist. And you've got Alan Sears from ADF. Listen to this question and listen to the fact that they don't have an answer. They've never even thought about it. Paul Blair. As far as what can we do, 2004, the state of Oklahoma amended legally our state constitution to define marriage as one man and one woman. 
We did everything right constitutionally. And we had one federal appointed judge throw it out. Now, when we're dealing with a judiciary that has turned the Constitution upside down, for example, the First Amendment, which is supposed to defend our religious liberty, is what they use to uh, take away our religious liberty. When after 138 years of no such thing as incorporation doctrine, all of a sudden in 1925 they create it and start applying it to states and, and municipalities where we can't put up a Christmas tree at Christmas. And when they're using the 14th Amendment, which at the time that was ratified, homosexuality was illegal in every state, but they're using the 14th Amendment to force homosexual marriage on every state. How do we win, not when we're facing judicial activism, but when we're facing judicial insanity? where it's very clearly black, yet they're saying it's white. How do we win there? Todd Starnes. <laughs> I'd like to get a quote from the ADF, uh, Alan Seekers. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, the simple answer, actually it's your business, Paul, is bastard. It's, first thing we need to do is pray. They don't have a clue. Good men. Now, but see, think about it. That's why this question must be asked. Because we got good people, and we are repeating the same mistakes of the past because we're playing in accordance to the limited rules that have been laid upon us. It's a, it's a, it's a false set of options. Well, you can go before this court, or you can go before that court. No, we actually have another option. We can actually decide to use the Constitution for once. You know what, ladies and gentlemen? It's a pretty good document. As Franklin said, it's not the best but it's awfully good. Don't know that we can come up with any better. And it's worked pretty well, it worked pretty well, and it will work if we will actually use it. And remember that we are not ruled by Washington. We are not 320 million people ruled by this cesspool on the Potomac. We are a union of states. You see this beautiful thing right here? That's called the state of Oklahoma. You know why this is around the outside here? It's called a border. It separates us from Texas, separates us from New Mexico, separates us from Colorado, separates us from Kansas, and separates us from Arkansas. There is a definite place where you exit Oklahoma and enter Arkansas and likewise these other states because we have an official recognized state border. And on top of that, we also have one of these. It's called a state capital. And inside that state capitol, we have one of these. That's our governor, Governor Mary Fallon. Inside the capitol, we also have one of these. It's our state legislature. Ours is bicameral. We have a House and a Senate. We also have one of these. It's called a state constitution. We also have one of these. It's called a state judiciary. By the way, this upcoming election cycle, we need to replace as many of these Supreme Court justices as we can. But you know why we have all of these? It's not for style points. It's because we are, in fact, a sovereign state. And it's we the people of the United States. States. In order to form a more perfect union. Yeah. That's exactly right. This is the answer. And this is what we're introducing. By the way, it's so wild and crazy. What's so wild and crazy about it? Because nobody's thought to do it in 150 years. What is it? We're actually going to follow the Constitution. Here's what we're asking people to do. Bobby, go ahead. If the governor... Our governor or any governor of any state said we had this uh, vote and we decided we, we don't recognize we don't recognize marriage between a man and a woman, and the attorney general wouldn't go along with it. What's the recourse there? Well, we are, I'd rather not answer on camera. <laughs> so when we turn the cameras off in a little while, we'll talk. Okay, we can hold it just a few minutes. Let me tell you what we got going on, and then I'll, get, then I'll bring you up an, an update once we, once we turn the cameras off. Here's what we're asking. We're asking to use our legislature to actually use the rule of law. Uh, one strategy that we are considering is actually having our state legislature amend <laughs> medical licensing in the state of, of, of Oklahoma to where doctors will honor their Hippocratic oath and do no harm to the patients. As you saw a while ago, we're not talking about choices. We're talking about human beings. We're talking about babies. And lawfully, within the state of Oklahoma, make medical licenses to where doctors cannot perform selective abortions or elective abortions. Still be there for the rare case to save the life of the mother, but it, we're just not going to have abortion in demand. Folks, there is no question that that is a state issue. No question whatsoever, lawfully, that that's a state issue. 
Second thing, we're going to uphold the state and federal constitution and defend marriage, as you heard John Eidsmo say a little while ago. When we have these officers sworn to uphold the U.S. Constitution and the state constitution, the only option they have is to enforce the constitution of the state of Oklahoma because we did not delegate that responsibility to Washington. So in the state of Oklahoma, the law of our land is that marriage is between one man and one woman. Now, I'm not talking theory. I'm saying lawfully. That is the law. Okay? We have right now over 710 pastors plus the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City that are on board with us. We hope to have a thousand pastors by the end of the month. We already had over 40 legislators. As a matter of fact, that number is approaching 50 right now. Here's the point. If we can reach the masses of we the people, we will win. Because it is still we the people. And it is still the consent of the government. The reason we continue to operate the way we are operating is because we are trained in our government education that the President and the Supreme Court rule 320 million people. That's not what the law says. And that's why we're not messing with California, we're not messing with Oregon or anything else. All we're concerned about is the state of Oklahoma. By the way, we are working with a number of other states that are also very conservative in their makeup. But we have a very conservative state compared to the rest. We have a pretty significant percentage of people that still at least profess to respect God and respect the Bible. So that's pretty fertile soil to work with. And we only have 3.8 million in population. Heavens, there are some cities around the country that have more population in their city than we have in our entire state. So we believe we have a pretty good chance of being able to reach a significant portion of that 3.8 million people, re-educate them with the truth and then once we the people are armed with the truth, we can stand with our governor and our attorney general. By the way, we have already met with them and we've had some very positive responses and we've got a strong House of Representatives especially. We'll have to drag the Senate uh, along the way. That doesn't sound like a bad idea, does it? Right? Drag it behind the back end of a truck for a while. But, uh, but the reality is it's this. I mean, th unfortunately, we have very few uh, Bobby Cleveland's and Sally Kearns and Mike Reynolds. We have very few principled leaders that have been elected to public office. We got a whole lot of politicians. So how do you get the attention of the politicians? Well, that's with the people. That's why we need the people. You know, if we just wind up with 15,000 or 20,000 people signed up on our petition, we're probably not going to get much done. If we get 100,000 or more signed up on our petition, I am absolutely convinced that we will be able to carry the ball across the finish line and make this happen. We had Protect Life Sunday week before last. We had Protect Marriage Sunday yesterday in our churches. I don't know how many of the churches participated. I'm certain I can tell you that two in this room did. I'm sure that Pastor Kern's church and our church did. And we, I know that there are a good number that participated. And then we're working towards a rally at the Capitol next Sunday, October the 25th at 4 o'clock. Folks, when you leave here today, if you would, I brought a stack of probably, probably a couple of hundred of these. This is a, a, a very well professionally done push guard. It just describes very briefly what we're doing here for marriage and for, and for a, a life issue. Uh, it's a very attractive. You can give this to your pastor. You can give this to friends. Uh, you can take a stack of them. Like I said, I brought probably a hundred or so here. Just take a few. I also brought a few of these petitions. Uh, please uh, go and get your neighbors, get your friends, get your co-workers. Fill out one of these sheets. There's seven blanks on it. Make copies of it if you'd like. And then mail it to our church. If you mail it to our church, my staff will enter this into our computer database so we can have the numbers. And then we also brought some of these flyers, reminders, Protect Life and Marriage Okay just for you. And you can also make copies of this and hand them out to some of your friends. Here's the thing. We are hoping, and this is going to be a good old-fashioned reclaiming of the state capitol. We're going to have a good Bible teaching and a time of prayer by some men and women of God at the capitol. We're going to be on the south steps. We've got, uh, I'm going to be serving as MC. I'll be beginning the thing and closing it with some marching orders. Uh, we have uh, several ordained men that aren't currently pastoring, including, and now this is encouraging, folks. We've got two of our congressmen that are very supportive of this and promoting it. Uh, that's Russell and Bridenstine. 
And uh, Senator Langford is, is coming around. In fact, he is going to show up at the event as a show of support for what we're doing, and he's going to speak for a few minutes. So that is, that is significant, because if, if Senator Langford will come on board, then we can get the Southern Baptist Convention to come on board, and that's also very big. But we'll have uh, Pastor uh, Kevin Clarkson from First War will be speaking for about 10 minutes on the life issue, on, on the same-sex marriage issue. Um, uh, Pastor Blake Gideon from First Edmund will be speaking on the life issue. We've got uh, one young lady that used to work as an abortionist. She's now very strong pro-life. She's going to share her testimony. Uh, then we're going to have a season of prayer. We've got, and this is, this is Christian. This is not denominational. This is born-again believers. Uh, Pastor Kern will be a part of our, our season of prayer at the end. Perry Green from Yukon Church of Christ will be part of our season of prayer. Uh, um, uh, Mark McAdow from First Methodist Church in Oklahoma City will be part of our season of prayer. And Jerry Peterson from First Lutheran in Oklahoma City. We're going to close with this season of prayer. We're going to have a beautiful rendition of God Bless America. Then I'm going to give you marching orders. And by the way, we've got the praise band from First Baptist Church in Claremore. So we'll have music starting about 3.30. And we'll have some music afterwards. It is going to be a tremendous event. I hope that we have, you know, what do we have? We'll probably have somewhere between one and 2,000 people. That's probably what we have on a Sunday afternoon during football season. But boy, wouldn't it be great if, if our pastors would get their churches and bring them up there and, and you all would tell all your friends and bring as many as you could. Wouldn't it be great if we had 5,000 people or 7,000 people or 10,000 people there and literally staked our claim at the, at the state capitol again? You know, they pull the Ten Commandments monuments off. Well, that's just carved in stone. Why don't we living testimonies of the Lord Jesus? Why don't we go and, and stake a claim there again? That is this Sunday at 4 o'clock. Please take any of this information and spread it if you would. Uh, again, we have not seen anybody that is a, a believer that opposes what we're doing. Hey, you love Jesus? Absolutely. You saved and going to heaven? Absolutely. How would you like to see abortion ended in Oklahoma? Oh, yes. How would you like to see marriage as God designed it, defended in Oklahoma? I'm all on board. Christians are there. The problem is we can't spend $5 million on a mass media campaign and run commercials. So we've got a significant number of people across the state that aren't aware of what we're doing yet. We're trying. We're publicizing it on bot radio and we're publicizing it by recruiting churches. We're using Facebook and things like that. But this has to be carried word of mouth. I have no doubt we can easily get at least 100,000 Christians if 100,000 Christians are aware of what we're doing. So please join us in making this happen. Brother Steve. I appreciate your presentation. Very good. Uh, Matt Staber and Liberty yes. Council. Uh, what are they saying about... Uh, <coughs> Matt Staber and uh, Liberty Council. Uh, I know that they're kind of on board. What are they saying about the uh, possibility of making this happen? Oh, I'm sorry. I won't run somebody that's a question. Well, Matt was actually uh, um, in town a week ago. His organization has been working with us. Of course, Matt is very excited. They are the ones that are representing court clerk Kim Davis, as Kim Davis has refused to, uh, to bow uh, to this. And the thing that he's excited about is the same thing I'm excited about. You see all that Kim Davis has been able to accomplish. Imagine if one state did that. Imagine if five or six states did that. And folks, that's what we're working on. We're working with a, a good number of states with members of their state legislature. And let me tell you, if 10 states stood up and said, no, marriage is what we, was what God determined. That's what we've sanctioned in our state. You don't have the authority to do this. We're not going to enforce your law. Folks, we can defeat this thing. We had a handful of states say, no, we're not aborting babies in our state. If Massachusetts wants to do it, California wants to do it, that's up to them. But in our state, we're not doing this. The federal government cannot force a state to abort children. They cannot force a state to recognize same-sex marriage. So uh, Staver is very much excited with this, as is Liberty Council. And Matt was with us. We had a very um, esteemed group. Uh, again, I, I am not at liberty to go into the details, but we did have a very productive meeting with our Attorney General and with our Governor and their Chiefs of Staff about uh, oh, a week ago, a week and a half ago, and it was, uh, it's very promising. So uh, uh, we're excited about the possibilities, and of course our legislature is, is uh, very much, I appreciate uh, David Brumbaugh and Nathan Dahm and, and their leadership in both the House and Senate 
Uh, it's, it's very encouraging, the, the steps that are taken. But ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, understand, it's up to us. If we get 100,000 people, <laughs> we're going to win. Our legislature will do the will of the people. If we have 5,000, 10,000 people at the Capitol, we're going to win. If we choose to stay home and watch the football game this weekend, and we have 500 people at the Capitol, and we only come up with 15,000 signatures, we're not going to win. So it literally is not up to Governor <clears throat> Fallon or up to General Pruitt. I am confident that both of them will work with us if it actually is the will of we the people. So it's going to be up to us. Bowls in our court. More questions? Well, I have one. Okay. I don't know. If, you probably didn't have a chance to watch any TV this weekend. <clears throat> but there was a, a great commercial on It's going to save me a lot of money in the future. It was a Campbell Soup commercial. Oh. Have you seen it or heard about it? No. Well, then I'll just uh, tell you, I saw it for the first time. I heard about it on the internet. Uh, you've probably seen the Star Wars movie. Uh, and Darth Vader says, I am your father. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this weekend we had Campbell's soup and a man sitting at the table, a little boy eating, and he's commanding him to eat his soup because I am your father. Mm -hmm. And then it cut to the other side of the table. And the other fella said, I am your father, eat your soup. So we've got two men that are the boy's father. Campbell's soup is history in my home, yeah. just like the Fritos yeah. that I told you about a week or two ago. <coughs> Never again. Look forward to that commercial and rid yourself of Campbell's soup. Oh, Thank you, Mike. Hey, folks, uh, we actually mentioned this yesterday, so the numbers are fresh in my mind. The propaganda out there, and if you were to watch television, Modern Family, all these other things, you're going to be convinced that half the population is homosexual. And that is just not true. Uh, in 1993, the Guttmacher Institute, which is a very pro-abortion, pro-same-sex, very liberal think tank, and, and they did research. And in 1993, their research concluded that only 1% of the population was homosexual. In 2011, the Williams Institute in UCLA did repeated that research. Now, UCLA is not a bastion of conservatism. Their data showed that there are 1.7% of the population that's homosexual. Guys, by definition, that is abnormal behavior. And I will not go into detail about the practices of homosexuality, but let me assure you, it is in no way, shape, form, it is, a, it is not anything that you practice with your spouse at home, I can assure you. It is a gross, by definition, perversion, because a perversion is to use something for something for which it was not intended, and a perversion is something that is, by definition, abnormal. Folks, when 98 0.3% of the population don't do something, and only 1.7% of the population does do something, the norm is the 98.3. Yep. That which would be considered an abnormal behavior is the 1.7. <clears throat> and that's what we're having pushed. And what's so dangerous about this is not, it's not that I'm worried about them coming to my church and enforcing me to perform a same-sex union. They'll be making popsicles and Hades for I ever do same Amen. But here's what's going to happen. If this is what's officially recognized by the state, then they are going to be teaching this to our children in our schools. And you won't have the ability to opt your children out. They're teaching enough credit. They're teaching enough. That's exactly right. That's where the danger is. The stats I just showed you a moment ago uh, should concern you, actually. 1993, only 1%. 20 years later, that number has almost doubled. Now, it's still a minuscule number, 1.7. But it's nearly doubled in 20 years. Well, why? It's because this lifestyle is now being openly pushed as normal. You know, think about it. When you're a teenager, you, you're, you go through an exploratory period. You know, when if you don't have Christ in your life, you're looking to fill that void. And you're, you're hey, I may try smoking cigarettes, or I may start drinking, or, or you may experiment with another thing. But never... And that search to fill that emptiness that only Christ could fill never was the idea of homosexuality considered as an option. Absolutely not. But now that is being pushed and presented on all of our children as well. Well, perhaps you're transgender. No, you're not. That's really easy. You know how you can tell when you go to the bathroom, unzip. You can tell like that what gender you are. It's not even tough, not tough at all. 
<laughs> and quite frankly, guys, it is more compassionate, and gals, it's more compassionate to speak the truth in love and try to save someone's life or save their soul than to placate some behavior that's going to result in an early grave. You know, the council, uh, the CDC, Council for Disease Control, did a report that came out in 2007. And their report showed that 72% of all new HIV and AIDS cases came from homosexuals. Now, when 1.7% of the population is responsible for 72% of the HIV and AIDS cases, you've got a problem now. That's not consistent. That's not normal. That's not safe like heterosexuality. That is incredibly dangerous to your health and well-being. If you are truly compassionate for your fellow man, you should want to tell the truth in hopes of saving their lives, if not their souls also. <clears throat> yes, sir. Well, the CDC published this, this year 1.3%. What was that? 1.3%. That was published this year by the CDC. But if you were to watch television, you would think it must be entitled. So, by the way, this one, and this, this was actually in USA Today. I saw it this, this month. I was coming back from somewhere. It, it stated that transgenders, people that are wrestling with their sexuality, are 10 times more likely, 1,000% more likely to commit suicide than someone else. Now, folks, if you're truly compassionate, shouldn't we be trying to help rather than just ignoring this? Yes, sir. Uh, the uh, age-specific surveys of homosexuals at age 20 when they came back and surveyed them again at age 30, it like had dropped by 50%. They left the lifestyle? So, right. Uh -huh. They had just moved away from it. And also, uh, the, our enemy is the religion that's practiced in our public school called humanism. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, we've got a great resource here in town, uh, a, a ministry called First Stone Ministries. It's led by a gentleman named Stephen Black. Stephen's a good friend. Stephen was a homosexual. He was caught up into that movement, that lifestyle, when he was a young man. Can you uh, use the mic? Hold up. <laughs> but, uh, uh, Stephen was saved some 30, 35 years ago. He's been married for 30 years and has. Uh, and he's a very, <clears throat> he's a very good resource in case you have an interest in doing any further research in that. Anything else? Okay, well, Paul, thank you. Uh, so. Grab some information and join us.